Doctors are on the front lines of the health care crisis in America. But when the volunteers from Rhode Island and Massachusetts went to Tennessee to help out, even they weren't prepared for the desperation. From lush countryside to rolling green hills, eastern Tennessee is a land of breathtaking beauty and startling poverty. Thousands of people will sleep in their cars, camp out in tents, and wait overnight, all for the chance to see the only doctor they can afford. I don't have the money to pay to go to a doctor. Jackie Leatherwood can barely hear out of one ear. She has poor vision, and at age 52, she's never had a mammogram. Uh, it concerns me sometimes, yes. So much so, she and her son James show up at the Bristol Motor Speedway for a free health clinic a full day before the gates open. The parking lot fills with the uninsured and underinsured desperate for care. As temperatures dip to a frosty 30 degrees, Jackie does what she's always done. She toughs it out. I even went to the hospital because I was uh, hemorrhaging at one point. They took care of it, sent me home because I had no doctor and I had no insurance. Okay, there you go. Day right. one, tickets go to the first 500 people. Jackie makes the cut. Now more lines. 92, 93, 94. She enters this vast motor speedway turned field hospital. E F P. Free vision, dental and medical care, even x-rays and eyeglasses made on the spot. State-of-the-art equipment volunteer doctors and nurses from Rhode Island and Massachusetts only dream of on their Central America missions. We have everything here at our disposal that we would have back in our offices. Uh, when, we, when we go to Central America, we're limited on, on what we can ship. This is a first for Dr. Carl Sakovitz from Bristol, Rhode Island, and his group Northeast Bosch. I'd like you to look straight ahead. For the first time in their 25-year history, they are medical missionaries to the United States, treating the burgeoning uninsured. There's something very personal when this is happening in your own country. You see the people here waiting for hours, if not days. Like how long have you been waiting? I've been waiting five hours today, and at least eight or nine yesterday. You can sense the urgency, the anxiousness. Dr. Rocco Andriozzi, a family practitioner in Westerly, reassures patients who fear medical neglect has led to life-threatening conditions. Did anybody ever tell you a very, very brave? He removes a concerning growth from Enos's back. But I can tell you this, it's definitely not dangerous. Yeah. All right, it's not cancer. Yeah. It's not a tumor. But sometimes fears are well-founded. Dr. Sakovitz breaks troubling news to Sally Shipley. She can't remember her last eye exam. Now she has macular degeneration. Yes, it's impairing your vision a little bit. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to lose your sight. Sally's nothing but grateful for the early warning, knowing her mom lost her sight to the same condition. In fact, graciousness and appreciation have been showered on all these doctors. When we say we're from Rhode Island, you know, they want to get up and give you a hug or a kiss. Back to Jackie and James, done with all their exams. Was it something special you were looking for? Linda Carpentier, an optician in Cranston, helps pick out glasses. These look better. Yeah. And Jackie's mammogram is clear, a huge relief. She's had to give up health care to pay the bills at home, in danger of losing her trailer. But she and James beam in their new glasses. They feel like now they have a chance. If you can't drive, you can't work. If you can't drive, you can't get groceries. You can't, you know, do things that you need to do to survive. And so these glasses are essential to just my well-being and the well-being of my family. We are rejoined with Dr. Carl Sakovitz. Uh, you just saw in the piece again, an optometrist from Bristol. I really was taken back Dr. Sakovitz by what James just said there at the end of the, the piece, that the very essence of being self-sufficient basically relies on some of those basic things like a pair of glasses so that you can see. And that's what you were providing down there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, he really hit the nail, <coughs> hit the nail on the head and, and, and said it uh, as well as anyone could. Uh, we're not talking about luxury items here. We're talking about the ability to see. We're talking about the ability to, to be free of pain. We're talking about the ability to eat without discomfort. Um, how can you begin to go forward in your life? How can you begin to, to contribute, hold a job, you know, be a productive member of society if, if you don't have these much most basic needs covered? And, 
And what were some of the patients saying to you that you saw and some of the other doctors? I mean, these were people, many of them, who held jobs and just didn't have health insurance or didn't have vision and dental. Absolutely. We, uh, you know, I, I anticipated people coming down from the high hills that, that maybe at one point uh, never were employable or were never employed, and that was not the case. We saw people that were hardworking Americans that have lost their jobs and have just continued to, um, to struggle for, for years now and are not making the most basic, uh, meeting their most basic needs. Um, they, they were probably the, one of the most polite and grateful group of people that I've ever worked with. Uh, they all you know, entered our, our examining area and the first opportunity they had, they would come out and say, I just want to thank you so much for what you're doing. And uh, that was their contribution and it was an important one and it meant a lot to us. We saw that as well, you know, after you would work with them and we'd, we'd talk to them about their experience or their situation. And every single one of them, as you said, mm. so grateful. And you know, the other thing is this is difficult. You know, I mean, this is coming out, spending the night as we saw, which is so eye-opening but then not being embarrassed or ashamed, or maybe it's just that they need that care so desperately they have no other choice. And, and you know, that was one of the nice things about the whole environment within this massive complex is people were treated with dignity, they were treated with respect, they were, they, it, was, it was just love in the air, and, and, and they felt it, and we enjoyed dispensing it, and um, it was a very, very positive environment in there, and uh, we all did our best. We worked as hard as we could, saw as many people as, as we could, and, um, and, and they were so grateful. Well, it was interesting you say that because I was talking to Jackie, who had, had the mammogram there for the first time at 52 years old. I talked to her about a week ago, so a couple of weeks after mm -hmm. we were down in Bristol, and she had said, you know, I need dentures. She had already had her teeth pulled, lost all her teeth, not this time, mm -hmm. another time, and she needs dentures, and she said, the next clinic is in for two years and there is one several hours away and she was contemplating going but she asked me do you think the people will be as nice the doctors and the nurses and volunteers will be as nice there and I, I, I said I think you're I'm in sure good they hands. Will be. you're I'm absolutely sure they will in good hands but how eye-opening to see those long lines and the people waiting overnight and some people that first night turned away after waiting all those hours. It's painful. It's brought out feelings in me that, uh, that I've never felt in other missions. We've gone to third world countries for 25 years. We anticipated poverty. We anticipated hardship. We found it. We did the best we could. And we felt that we'd contribute to, to, to each individual that we'd seen and contributed to trying to make life a little easier. Seeing this in our own country really is a painful thing because I feel there's a responsibility that we have to our fellow citizens to try to um, give them a platform to work from, give them, give them you know, the ability to, to live pain-free, give them the ability to see, give them the ability, give them a foundation to work from. And, and these folks don't have that. They're in quicksand and they're sinking. And um, you know, these are fellow Americans and they're good fellow Americans. They're people that have been here, they've contributed over the years, They've fallen on hard times, and um, you know the economic avalanche has just taken them out, and they are yet to, to, to stand up and brush themselves off. Well, you and uh, the other volunteers from Northeast Bosch are helping them get on their way. Yes. All right, uh, even for those without or with insurance, most of their plans don't include vision or dental care. When we come back, a growing crisis. Eight out of ten people who show up for the clinic in Bristol, Tennessee, need a dentist. The neglect surprised even the Northeast Bosch volunteers. What they saw rivaled the need in third world countries. The lines are dishearteningly long. The wait nearly as painful as the aches that brought the uninsured and underinsured to this free medical clinic set up inside the Bristol Motor Speedway. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. 500 people from Tennessee and beyond would get in on day one. Hundreds would be turned away, like Gary Hughes, the front desk clerk at our hotel. Everything all right with your stay last night? Gary has a full-time job, but no health insurance. He hasn't seen a dentist in 14 years. His whole life, he's hidden his smile, too embarrassed to open his mouth. He and his wife, Tara, slept in their car in the parking lot only to learn by morning the clinic was full. A little disheartened, but what can you do? Gary missed his chance. Two days left at the clinic, but he has to work. Tara is five months pregnant. A badly infected wisdom tooth jeopardizes her baby's health. It's 
probably the fifth or sixth time that my bottom back one has abscessed. I've been on antibiotics eight or nine times for it. I can't afford to have it pulled. Of all the doctors here, dentists see the most patients. We haven't seen decay in Central America like this, and we're not sure what, what's doing it, but uh, it's bad. Dr. Frank Casarella, a dentist from Seekonk and one of the Northeast Vosh volunteers, thought he'd be doing more cleanings and fillings. But unlike Honduras and El Salvador, it's almost all extractions. Preventative care is a luxury people here just can't afford. So after years of neglect, their teeth can't be fixed, they need to be yanked. Here's a small collection of teeth that dentists have extracted in just a couple of hours. Jeff Smith is losing all his teeth. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was in the parking lot for a couple of days and now here they're going to be gone, so that's worth it. The pain so debilitating, it's hard to eat, even talk. They were decayed so badly, we couldn't get a grip with our forceps to remove the tooth. But Dr. Casarella gets the job done and sends Jeff home gripping gauze between his gums. So you're thinking this is going to change your life? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can eat. Remember Tara, five months pregnant? She made it into the clinic the second day. Dr. Jeff Burns, a family physician from Massachusetts, says it's critical for Tara to remove that abscess tooth. And child uh, being born much earlier than it should have and or being infected. So you can have stillbirth, stillbirth because of this. Now, finally, the tooth is coming out, but not easily. This hurts. <laughs> okay. She nearly calls it quits. One last tug from Dr. Casarella. So, you're done, you're done. Good job. Like most patients here, Tara will go back to a hard life, but now she's healthy and pain-free. Now I think I can just focus on keeping myself, you know, healthy and and prepare for the baby to come. But it has the zebra. The zebra's my favorite. Husband Gary will have to wait for some other clinic, some other year. And though he hides his painful teeth behind a shy grin, with his first child on the way, there is reason to smile. But unless the health care crisis is solved, Northeast Vosh volunteers know their kindness will be needed again. And we are back with Dr. Carl Sakovitz. And Dr. Sakovitz, that was very difficult for me to be there shooting that and being there. I mean, just to watch so many people lose every single tooth in their mouth. It's tough to watch. It is. And um, I think it's important that we show it, though, because yes, absolutely. It, 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 it is, it's the, it's, the, it's the situation, unfortunately. And I think, too, you know, now the, the problem is, is most people can't afford dentures, and dentures are, you know, ten, twelve thousand dollars they can be, so they may wait for another clinic two years or mm -hmm. so to come back. And, and again, something that we just take for granted, and, but if they don't have their, to their teeth removed, like mm -hmm. we saw with Tara, that can lead to so many serious medical problems. Heart disease can go to the brain. And, and, that's, and that's a good point here. Little problems turn into big problems. Things that, that you or I would address uh, immediately are, are just not available. And even those people that left the clinic pain-free today very well may be in, in trouble with another tooth, you know, six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks down the road. There's a situation that I saw in Nicaragua years ago where a friend of mine who lives down there um, was just picking fruit in his own uh, orchard got hit in the eye with, with a piece of fruit and had a corneal abrasion, which is something that, that is frequently heals on its own or, or will heal with some basic intervention. Down there, he had no sanitary conditions. He had no antibiotics. That small abrasion grew into a fungal infection. Ultimately, he wound up losing the eye. Wow. And that's not that different from what we're seeing here. Small problems becoming big problems and at times life-threatening problems. That's why they have to be taken yeah. care of by people like you. So since you've been back for a couple of weeks, what has the response been to you and the other volunteers from Northeast Bosch? Well, um, it, 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 was, it was an incredibly rewarding experience and an eye-opening experience. And um, uh, I've committed to going back. Most of our volunteers uh, have committed to going back and doing more, more work, an annual mission at least, 
here in the United States. So now that will make two because that you will. still go to Central America. In fact, you're going we're, to Panama. We're hoping to go to Panama in, in January. January. And, and now then, you want to add another yes, domestic we're, mission. We're going to do that. And wow. um, there are some members of our group. Larry Ginsburg, for example, is going to be going to Wise, Virginia, and doing a mission. And he may bring some of our members with him this fall. But I think that it certainly has opened my eyes, and uh, and I no longer can can turn my back on on what we've seen. We, we need to be involved. Members of our group that did not participate are hearing and seeing, and and saying, "Hey, I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to hop on board with the next domestic mission too." So, um, what about your patients, people who you know you've worked with, or your neighbors? What are they saying about what they've seen, or the conditions right here in our well, own country? I, I think I think their reaction is similar to mine. It's 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 appalling. It's painful. You know, we we all feel some sense of responsibility to, to not allow this type of suffering to go on. Uh, we don't have a quick fix. But, but, th but this is really a band-aid, so to speak, as great it is. as it is, it's a band-aid. It is, but we've, it's, we've got, you know, you've done a wonderful job of exposing the predicament and exposing, and I'm sure that we can find scenarios like this here in our home state. We can find it in every state. But at least now, we've, we're, my eyes have been open to it, our viewers' eyes have been open to it, and, and hopefully um, that's a start. It's a start, a great one, all right. After the break, the difference you can make. If you'd like more information about Northeast Vosh or how you can get involved, go to our website, abc6.com, and you will find a link to their website. Now, Let's talk about getting involved because we saw in the first piece at the top of the show how people bring in glasses that you take over to Central America. That's just one way. Yes, it is, and, and those are always needed, and we collect those year-round. The other way is um, we try to bring professional school students with us, optometry school students, medical school students, dental school students with us at a point in their careers when we can not only help educate them through the experience but influence them and get them involved with volunteering. Uh, you can sponsor a student for $600, and that helps. So th those three ways, right? That's great, and they'll have more information on the website. Now, for ABC6's part, we plan to go to state lawmakers and ask them if they'll support legislation that would allow similar clinics in Rhode Island. We thank you for joining us tonight for this ABC6 News Special. Have a great night.